Are you ready for God's word? Amen. Now this subject matter is powerful. And I was actually blown away by the response from first and second service. And the subject I'll be covering today, it's about a lingering fog that moves in unexpectedly and it chokes out, drowns out, and blocks out the sunshine of your life. It's lingering and hard to deal with and it's hard to blow it out. It just seems to lay there dead. Bringing forth destruction. You say, oh, pastor, what is it? I'm talking about depression. Depression and how depression comes in when you least expect it. And it just tends to drown out the sunshine and joy in a person's life. You say, oh, pastor, I don't need to talk about depression. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Well, I guess it's for those that don't believe. Those that aren't strong in their faith. Those that don't know who they are in Christ. Can I tell you that's not true? Can I tell you that some of the most remarkable uh, individuals in God's word that God used suffered with depression? (laughs) Suffered with depression. We'll talk about that in just a second. But first I want to share with you a couple of things, but not before I share my my title with you. The title of today's message is Daunting Depression, but I don't want to leave you with daunting depression. I want to talk to you about dynamic hope. Dynamic hope. And you say, why dynamic hope? Hope. Well, the the definition of dynamic that I'm using is a person, a person that's positive in attitude, full of energy, and is ready for new ideas, new frontiers. That means you're ready to experience the future of life. You're not ready to lay down and be overcome by this depression. You say, okay, well, what is depression? Well, according to the medical journals that I was studying, depression, uh, also known as major depressive disorder, is a common and serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and the way you act. It can lead to a variety of, of emotional and physical problems and can decrease, decrease your ability to function at work, at home, and anywhere you find yourself. Because the truth is, this is a cloud that follows you. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've tried to blow that cloud out. You've tried to route run it. You've tried to disseminate. You've tried to dispel it. You've tried to do everything in your power. And yet, it just seems to linger. So I want to tell you a little bit more about the symptoms. These symptoms are not just um, something that happens, you know, now and again. Because we all get down now and again. Come on, how many of us have mourned the loss of a loved one. And it's proper to mourn. You have to take the time. Even Jesus mourned and Jesus wept and Jesus was familiar with with sorrow. It's okay to feel sorrow. I'm not talking about Christians that maybe have to change jobs, change careers, go through the loss, have a breakup, experience a rough day and experience the highs and lows of life. After all, It was uh, Bruce Lee who said, uh, don't pray for an easy life. Pray for the strength to endure the difficult one. Because how many of us know life is difficult? Difficult. So then what are we talking about? We're talking about this lingering depression that lasts for weeks, if not months, and in some dire cases, even years. It can also be Listen to me very, very closely. It can also be triggered and be closely associated with, with, with uh, physical problems. But I'm not just talking about physical problems because those can be addressed, such as thyroidism and brain tumors, vitamin deficiencies, things of that nature. So we are going to talk a little bit about go and get your health checked and make sure you're in the best physical shape you can be. Take care of your body. But I'm talking about the depression that is estimated to affect 
one in every 15 adults in America today. How about this? One in every six Americans will suffer from depression in their lifetime. Can I tell you this? This number is so much higher than the rest of the world. You might ask yourself a very important question right now. Ask this question. Why is America being riddled with this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, a relentless attack? Where does this come from? Is it, is it due to the way we live? Yes. Is it due to the way we eat? Yes. Is it due to how we focus on certain things? Yes, all of those things are true. But it's also due to the fact, I believe, that the enemy has set his sights on us. Why? Why would he set his sights on us? Think about this with me for a second. Jesus, in Matthew 24, was asked by his disciples, tell us about the end. Give us the signs we should look for. And he says this in Matthew 24, 14. 14. He says, and this gospel... What's the gospel? The good news that Jesus saves. That's the gospel. This gospel of the kingdom of God shall be preached in all the world as a testimony to me, and then I'll come back. Then I'll come back. Can I tell you the nation that has been more responsible for evangelizing the world than any other in the history is America? This great little nation. Hasn't been here that long, but yet there is a zeal in the hearts of the Christian Gentiles that want to go to the ends of the earth. And I think Satan sees that and says, I got to snuff that out. I got to riddle them and plague them with depression so that they won't want to go outside their house, let alone across an ocean. But I'm telling you, greater is he who is within you than he who's in the world. Amen. Amen. God is with you. And so, yes, this is pandemic. Yes, this is pervasive. Yes, and you might be thinking, but pastor, I'll never suffer because I'm a mature Christian. I want you to know depression can affect anyone. Anyone. In fact, did you know that Moses himself suffered from depression? I'm not saying his whole life, no. But there is a story recorded in God's word where it's, it's without a doubt he was struggling. What was going on? He was overwhelmed with the problems of this world. He had taken on way too much. And so he was run down physically. He was run down emotionally. And it affected him spiritually. How was he run down? He was hearing day and night all the problems of the nation. Some of us have taken on too many problems from outside. And it's not healthy and you are being squashed beneath them. Can I tell you, if you allow the world to pile on, they will. This is something I've had to learn as a pastor because so many times I get calls and people say, Pastor, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. And I started noticing it's not good for me to carry their problems. I'm not meant to carry their problems. And I started noticing something else. I'm caring more about their problem than they're caring about it. Have you noticed that sometimes? Someone will come tell you about their marriage and how it's falling apart, but then they go off and they continue to wreck their marriage and you're worried. And you're sitting there going like, oh my gosh, their children and their spouse and this and that. And I'm just saying, you know what? They don't care. Why do I care so much? My marriage is good. <laughs> do you hear what I'm saying? And so I've learned to say, no, Lord, your word tells me to cast my cares on you. And I am doing no one any good if I'm having them cast their cares on me. I need to teach them to cast their cares on you. And so some of us have been carrying the weight of our families, have been carrying the weight of our office, have been carrying the weight of our neighborhood and our relatives and those that we love. But you need to put it at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, it's yours. Lord, it's yours. I'm giving it to you, God. And so you have Jonah the great evangelist that led an entire, an entire nation of Nineveh, city of Nineveh, to, to repentance. At the end of that revival, he was sitting on the outskirts of town asking God to take his life, as Moses did. You see, these great men of faith ask God to take their life? 
Yes. How about this? How about the great prophet Elijah, who took on the very prophets of Baal at the, uh, I was going to say the OK Corral, but he, he was at Old Mount Carmel, right? And he met with 500 of them, some, some 400 and something of them, and, and he took them all and he called down fire from heaven. It was miraculous. And then after that, he chased down, he chased them all down, put them to death. This was a great feat. Not only that, he ran before a chariot, the Bible says. The chariot was going back, and he was running in front of the chariot. A marathon at full sprint under the power of the Spirit of God. But he reached a point where he collapsed, and Jezebel wanted to kill him. Then he cried out to the Lord, I alone am left, and I'd rather die, God. I'd rather die. You go, oh, but that was the Old Testament. That's not the New Testament. The New Testament shows the Apostle Paul struggled. The New Testament shows us that, that the great prophet John the Baptist, of whom Jesus said there was none like him, he was in a, in a, in a dingy, dark dungeon, and he let this emotional distress get the best of him where he doubted if Jesus was the Messiah. How could this happen? Because I'm telling you, the Bible records these events for your sake. For your sake. Why? Because the Bible wants you to know loud and clear it can happen to anybody. And if it happens to you, take heart. Take courage. As God was with them, he is with you. And if he can get them through it, he can get you through it. And if the best of the best go through it, don't be surprised if you find yourself going through it. Know this, that this dark night of the soul is meant to make you better. It's meant to make you better. Take courage, amen? You say, yeah, but that's from God's word. What about outside of God's word? How about Abraham Lincoln? Great political leaders like Abraham Lincoln or Winston Churchill that said he called his depression a big black dog that was hounding him. And he could feel it running after him. And so I'm here to tell you that it's not just biblical leaders, it's not just political leaders, but it's also preachers of the gospel. Charles Spurgeon, the one who is called the Prince of Preachers. But the one I want to talk to you about today and the one I'm going to highlight for you today is none other than my hero of the faith, David. David struggled with depression. You're going to see this in his Psalm chapter 42. You don't just see it in his Psalm 42. You see it in Psalm 51 and many, many others. But you see the victory that God gave him as well. And so I want to encourage you. Before we're over, we're going to cover three basic points. Are you with me? Three basic points. Not four, not five, three. And they're going to go like this. If you want to overcome depression... You must look inward. You must look upward. And you must look onward. Inward, upward, onward. Now, I've got to share something with you. I give credit where credit is due, and that is to the great uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers. Dr. Adrian Rogers is a man of faith and a pastor he pastored in Memphis, Tennessee. He's a Baptist minister, and he is a hero of the faith for me. I heard him preach this message years ago, and I just had to come back to it, and God led me to it. And so if you want to know, you want to hear his messages, you can still hear him, even though he's gone to be with the Lord, at Love Worth Finding. Just type in Love Worth Finding, do a Google search. He'll come up, and you will have your socks blessed off. He is such a blessing. I'll tell you. Uh, what, what a hero in the faith he is to me. When I went to Memphis for the only time and first time, only and first time, I didn't go see Elvis, could care less about Elvis. I sing his songs, that's good, that's cool, but, but he's a man. And, and, uh, and, and he didn't walk with the Lord. I didn't go see Bill Street and listen to that, blues, or none of that. You know where I went? 
I went to Bellevue Baptist Church where Adrian Rogers was used to build an amazing, amazing church for the honor and glory of God. And they gave me the whole tour and let me know all about his life, gave me some free CDs and whatnot. And I loved it. I loved it because that's what we should honor. Matter of fact, then he preached this and he said, he said, David struggled with depression. You might say, but why? Why would David struggle with depression? Well, he had found himself far removed from God. Come on, how many of you have ever felt like you're so far from God you can't even see him anymore? How many of you have ever felt like you lost your way and, and the world is just coming against you and you're being chased and the more you run, the further away from God you get? This was David. You go, but, but how? He brought it upon himself. You want to know how? He lusted after a woman. He committed adultery with her and then killed her husband to cover it up. And he thought he got away with it. Meanwhile, letting his relationship with God deteriorate because how many of you know when you do wrong, the last person you want to be talking to is God. And so for a year, he just didn't talk to God until the prophet comes to him and the prophet rebukes him in the way of a story. The prophet tells him a story. He's clueless. He doesn't know the prophet's talking about him. So in his indignation and anger, he says, and he pronounces judgment over the, the character in the story. And the prophet looks at him and says, you are that man. Stunned. He just pronounced death over himself. He falls to his knees, asks God to forgive him. God tells the prophet, tell David he will not die. So he tells David, you're not going to die, God says, but your, but your judgment, you have to live by it now. And from that moment, the son that was born to him through that evil act of betrayal died. He mourns the, son, the death of his son. Then a, a daughter of his is raped. Then a son kills another brother and he has to deal with another death in his family. Then the son that killed this brother ends up turning against his own father and takes over the palace and the capital city. David has to run for his life. David's military generals overcome his son Absalom that betrayed him and they kill him in grand fashion. After David said, I don't want him harmed. So now he has all this hurt just unfolding in his family and he's dealing with the shame and the guilt. Come on now, feel this. He's dealing with the shame and the guilt that keeps telling him it's your fault. And he feels far from God. And this is why he writes these words. He says, as a deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. Now, I want you to understand something. He is experiencing the worst kind of spiritual dryness you can experience. How many of you have ever experienced spiritual dryness? Jesus says, come to me and I will give you what? Living water to drink. Living water but some of us find ourselves being chased by the hound of depression. What do you mean being chased by that? The only time a deer pants is when it's running for its life. And it will not stop to drink water until it feels safe. As a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you. But I haven't been able to drink, God, because I can't shake this. Do you hear me? Some of us are feeling that right now. You have felt it. Or someone you love is going through it right now. And God is touching your heart saying you need to be there for them. You need to walk with them. You need to pray with them. You need to love them. So my soul thirsts for you, God, for the living God. When, listen to the words, when, I can't see when. When will I be done with this? When? See, what you're experiencing there through David's writing is a desperation. He's desperate to connect with the living God again, to shake this awful feeling, and it's daunting. Daunting how? 
It's torment. It's shame. It's ridicule. How do we know this? Because he says it in his Psalms. Watch verse three. My tears have been my food day and night. That means it's like forever just tormenting me. Day and night, I cannot shake it. Why they continually say to me, who is they? The voices in his head are continuously saying, the world is telling him, the enemy is telling him, he's telling himself day and night. They say to me, where is your God? God has for... And he goes on to say, I remember these things. I look back with great fondness, but now it's such a distant memory. It just brings me pain that I once used to go with the multitude. I used to go to the house of God. I used to praise with joy and praise. I used to be one of the, but now. With the multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. What is a feast if it's not a sign of joy? I used to have joy. But now I just feel so overwhelmed. Look at his words in in verse 7. But before verse 7, read verse 6 with me. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan. Now take special note of the land of the Jordan. And from the heights of Hermon. That's Mount Hermon. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. At your waves and billows have gone over me. He's saying, I'm drowning, I'm overwhelmed beneath these cares and struggles and depression of life. I'm about to die, God. Do you hear him? Have you ever been there? I'm talking about something that happens to everyone, but for you, you just couldn't shake it. Maybe it was the loss of a loved one. And you thought you could get over it, but somehow it just lingered and you just can't get through it. Maybe it was the breakup or divorce. The loss of a job or having to change careers. There's a number of things that could happen. Or maybe like David, you fell. You fell into sin and the consequences are more than you can bear and you're having trouble. Either way... I want to highlight this idea of the Jordan covering him because the Jordan is known, listen to me very closely, as the river of death. You say, whoa, river of death. I thought it was the river of life. That's where you get baptized. The Jordan waters were baptismal waters. Well, what is baptism if not dying to your old self? Buried with Christ in baptism so that you can raise up to walk a new life. I'm dead to my old self that I may live for Christ. And so David is going through the baptismal waters where God is saying, I'm going to wash you white as snow, but the old you has to die. I need you to understand this because when you're going through depression, you can't help but feel many times, oh, this is happening to me. But instead, you need to talk to yourself and say, no, it's not happening to me. It's happening for me. It's a small little shift, but it will make all the difference. It's happening for me so that I can be closer to God than I've ever been. So that I can let go of some stuff I need to let go of. So that I can gain perspective in the way I need to look at things from now on. I've been looking one way and God wants me to look his way. Amen? And so this is important, guys. This is important because he feels deserted. He feels like he's been treated unfairly. Can I tell you, Job felt the same way. How many of you know the story of Job? What you may not know, because so many times when when we were taught it as kids, and so many people missed this very, very important point, God didn't do this to Job for no reason. The Bible says, listen to me very, very closely, he works all things for the good of those who love him. What the enemy meant for evil, he will use for good. And so the enemy comes before the Lord. The Lord highlights Job and the enemy says, yeah, but that's because you protect him. If you remove the protection, let's see how good he is then. And God says, I'll play. Why? Because the, 
What the enemy doesn't know is that he can't get over on God. He cannot get over on God. The enemy is being used by God to facilitate what needs to happen in Job's heart. And how do we know this? Because the whole book is about this, these trials that are coming to Job. And Job keeps saying, I don't know why, I don't know why. And his friends, listen to me very closely, his friends keep accusing him. And Job keeps saying, no, no, I'm, not, that's, I'm perfect, that's not me. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Finally, a young man who hasn't spoken through the entire book shows up at the end of the book and he says this to him. He says, I've been listening to you old heads talk. And you old heads have been saying that Job has to have done something wrong, but Job keeps saying he's perfect. Can I tell you something? And this is where he comes out with the whole point of the trial and the whole point of the book. He says, if you are perfect, Job, then you would be standing in judgment of God. And if you are perfect, then God owes you because he has done wrong and you can accuse him of doing wrong by you. But you need to understand you're not perfect. And it's that very pride that God is dealing with so that he can help you die to yourself that you might walk. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. And sometimes the only way to accomplish that is to take you through the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul. See, this is the reason why David feels deserted because God has taken him through this dark night where he says, why have you forgotten me, God? Why have you forgotten me? And God is about to show him his spiritual provision and protection. Now, here's where the message starts. And I got five minutes to finish it. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes, Are you ready? Come on. Okay, here, here it is. God says, I need you to look inward. I need you to look deep down in your heart. And that's the first point. You have to look inward. And when you look inward, you start to see that God is your provider, that he is your protector. And this is why Psalms 91 says this, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely you shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. You are everything I need. Can I tell you what David is saying there? God, I realized that as I looked inward, upward, and onward, I found forgiveness for my sin in the mercy of your love. How? It's in the words he uses here in this psalm and in other psalms. He says, under the shadow of your wings. What does it mean under the shadow of your wings? Remember, David is the one early on in his career when he first became king that brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And when he put it there in Jerusalem, he put it under a tent, a cover. But the cover didn't have sides. And so in the evening and in the morning, the sun would come in through the side and cast a shadow. And while you couldn't go under the tent, you could stand where the shadow was. And he said, Lord, I've learned in my deepest, darkest moments, even though I can't be that close to you because I've fallen away, God, I can still feel the shadow of your love. And those wings on the top of the Ark of the Covenant is known as the mercy seat. God, just have mercy on me as the shadow of your wings cover me. Come on, sometimes we just gotta pray like that. Say, Lord, just, just have mercy on me, my King. And I've learned, and so he learned to look inward. Stay with me on this. Watch what the words say right there as he looks inward, okay? You with me? I'm going to read out of Psalms 42, verse 5. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? Notice how he asks himself a question. When you're going through it, you've got to learn to talk to yourself. 
I'm not talking about like the guys in Austin that talk to themselves on the side of the road. That's the different kind of talking to yourself. I'm talking about talking to yourself in a good, productive manner. Do you realize David is saying to his soul, what is your soul? The soul is your intellect, your mind, your will, your emotions. How many of you know that when you're going through it, your emotions are way out of whack? Now, I'm going to share a couple of things. As you look inward, you might have to ask some hard questions. Why are you feeling this way? You might have to realize that your diet is all out of whack. You're taking too much caffeine. You're taking stimulants from all sorts of energy drinks that have knocked your physiological health out of balance. Do you know you can fry your adrenal system and you can become adrenally fatigued to the point your adrenal glands are what gives you the hormones and the chemicals to feel good. And when they're shot, you, all you feel is stressed. And then from the stress comes the crash of depression. And so you might need to say to yourself, hey, I've been trying, I've been mistreating my body. Can I say something else to you? You should not, when you're feeling bad, drink alcohol because alcohol is a depressant. So you're helping yourself feel worse. Stay away from alcohol. Don't take external substances. Let me share another thing with you. Be careful of the music you listen to. When you're feeling lousy, you don't want to put trash in. You're listening to all kinds of demonic stuff about about this or that, or maybe it's not demonic, but it's just good old-fashioned country music that makes you feel like kicking your dog and everything else. (laughs) Stop listening to that. Put on some worship music, amen? But he's asking himself the hard question, why are you feeling like this? He's telling his emotions, come on, get in line. Can I tell you, I remember stumbling upon this when I was 13 years old. We used to live in a small, beautiful country town where everything was in order. It was the glory years of our family. And then my dad, my dad used to coach our baseball team, our basketball team. We were involved in every aspect. He was involved in every aspect of my life. And then he moved us to inner city Houston, second ward, He buried himself in his work and he left us to fend for ourselves in a place we weren't equipped. Not only that, I felt completely like a fish out of water. I I need you to, I need you to understand this. I show up to my high school with ropers and wranglers and nobody wears ropers and wranglers. Inner city, they have a black shirt, the khaki pants, the the white uh, converse with the color of their gang hanging. And the shirt was black, and it either said Megadeth, Slayer, some kind of concert shirt, which I didn't listen to any of that trash. And immediately, I say, okay, I don't fit in. Let me try this. I come back with orange parachute pants, a purple sweatshirt, pink high tops with yellow shoelaces. I look like Zach from Saved by the Bell, or better yet, Slater from Saved by the Bell. Looked like I stepped right off the set. You know how hard they were on me and how I left my friends and I felt just so depressed. I started to skip school and I found myself in an inner city park. And that's the place you don't want to be. I know for a fact there's a God because he protected me. He protected me. But on that park bench, I can remember asking, Chris, why do you feel so down? Why are you here? Because my dad brought me here because of this, because of that. And then I can remember saying, why do I feel like you're nowhere to be found, God? And then I heard God's voice say, through his word, I had memorized much of his word. As a young man, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And I grabbed onto that verse. I said, okay, Lord, if you'll never leave me or never forsake me, Why am I going through this? And I'll never forget the next verse that popped into my heart. It said, I work all things for the good of those who love me. I work all things for the good of those who love me and are called according to my purpose. I've got you. I won't let you go. Come on, can you hear me right now? I've got you. I won't let you go. Why are you telling me this story, Pastor? Because I'm here to tell you that the number one cause of death of teenagers is suicide. And it's all led by depression. 
Depression is the number one cause of death for those that are young. And the enemy had me like a duck on a dune boat, like white on rice. But God said, not today, not my son. I'm going to fight for him. But I had to look inward. And I had to ask some hard questions. In looking inward, I started to look upward. And it's never left me. This idea that God is there for me has never left me. And I want to give it to you as a gift from his word. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. And he works all things for the good of those who love him. Just love him. Just love him and he'll hang. He'll, he'll be there with you. Now, now watch this. A couple weeks ago, I started realizing that I've been battling this knee problem for a year and I started getting a little depressed because I don't see any signs of it getting better. And every time I try to rehab it, it just gets worse. And I try to rehab it and it gets worse. And people have told me all kinds of things. You don't want to have surgery. And I've read all kinds of things. If you have surgery or after the age of 50, it doesn't really help your knee. Da, 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 da. I'm gaining weight. I don't like it. I can't be active. And so the other night, I was up all night. I was up all night last night. That's why I started drinking coffee today. And I didn't drink it like in months. And so I'm wired. <laughs> but uh, but I'll, t- I'll tell you this. Some of you are going faster. Stay, stay with the plane. Yeah, I'm already behind. Come on. Y'all got to listen better. Um, So this is what happens. This is what happens. I'm up all night and I just, I just told, you know, I've been praying to the Lord and I'm like, man, Lord, I just, I just want to tell you, I love you, but I don't have a joy for life anymore. I just don't. I don't, I used to be the one that loved life. I just don't. So I woke up in the morning. I always wake up. How do I wake up? This is the day that the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. I said, Lord, I don't feel joy. I don't. And I got up out of bed and my wife got up. She goes, how you doing, baby? She, I said, <laughs> I'm laughing now, but I wasn't laughing then. I said, I just don't have a joy for life, babe. I think that's done. Because one thing she's always known about me, I just love life. I love life. Because I just don't know if I love it anymore. I'm not quitting, but I guess I'm going to have to learn to be like the rest of these guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And so, and so I'm, I'm saying this to her, and she's like, no, baby, don't give up. And you know the problem with pity parties? Nobody wants to come. <laughs> they don't want to come, even though you invite them. And they definitely don't bring gifts, right? And so I'm having a pity party. And then uh, I, I feel like I start talking to the Lord because my wife, like, she left. She's like, you got to handle this with God. And so I started talking to God again. No, nope, Lord. And she goes, you didn't read the verse of the day. And I said, yeah, okay. So I pulled up the verse of the day. And guess what it was? I work all things for the good of those who love me. This is a couple days ago. And I called according to my purpose. And I just started laughing. I go, God, I'm back. I'm back. I got joy again, Lord. I got, you just speak so good. And then I could just feel, I could just feel this, come on my soul. Oh, don't you get, sound me, lift up your voice. Because you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on my soul. Oh, don't you get shy me, lift up your voice. Got a lion. And that's what David is doing is he starts to look upward. Because if you want to overcome depression, you got to look inward, upward. And look at what he says. He says, deep calls out to deep. The waves are covering me, verse 7. But verse 8 says, the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. I'm going to make it through the nighttime. And in the daytime, his joy is going to find me. Because joy always comes in the morning. And then he says, I will say to God, my rock. I will call out to him. Why have you forgotten me? Remember me, Lord. Remember me, Lord. Remember me, God. And he will, in fact, Remember me. And so not only does he look inward, not only does he look upward and start crying out to God, but then he looks onward. He looks onward. What do we mean by looking onward? It means you trust. You trust what God has shared with you. And you trust that 
God is too good to be unkind, too wise to make a mistake. And even though you cannot trace his hand, you can trust his heart. Listen to that again. He's too good to be unkind to you. He's too wise to make a mistake. And even though you cannot trust his hand, you, can, you cannot trace his hand, you can trust his heart. And this is where I finish. So there's a poem by Robert Frost, the great poet, and it's God's speech to Job. God's speech to Job. And he says this, you were afflicted within those old days. But it was of the essence of the trial, you shouldn't understand it at the time. It had to seem unmeaning to have meaning. And it came out all right. I have no doubt you realize by now the part you played. Break it down. You were afflicted in your life in the past. And you need to understand something about trials. They're hard to understand. In fact, they're supposed to seem like they don't have meaning. Because if you understood it all, then it wouldn't be a trial. But because you don't understand it all, it's a trial. But now you realize, as you look back, that it turned out all right. And I was working things for your good. Amen. Therefore, don't get stuck. Move upward. Look upward. Look inward. And move onward. How do we know he moved onward? When well, verse 11 he says, Hope in God. Hope in God, right smack in the middle. And it reminds me of what Paul says as he overcomes his bout, as he overcomes his discouragement. Watch what Paul says to the Philippian church. He says, not that I've already obtained it or have already arrived at my goal. It means I'm not there yet, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, I let go what is behind and I press on towards what is ahead to win the goal. What is he saying? He's saying I've had to learn how to let go of guilt, shame, disappointments. And I've had to learn to concentrate moving towards Jesus and the future he has for me. Some of us have gotten stuck because we won't let go. We won't let go. And the more you hold on, the more the enemy will use it against you. And you will have that shame and regret grow and grow and grow. And Paul is saying, no, I've learned how to let go. Some of us have to quit reminding God of your sin. Because he's already said, I've forgotten it. I've plunged it. I've separated it. But you keep reminding him of it. I'll tell you one more thing as we finish. The, the Apostle James, the book of James says that if you want to get healed from your past sin, you share it with a trusted brother, a trusted friend. Not just any old knucklehead. I'm talking about a real person that walks in honor of Jesus Christ. Someone you can really trust. Because this is what happens. You get forgiveness from God, but you get healing from your brother. And maybe you need to share with a brother, hey, this is what's been riddling me with, with shame or hurt. I can't let this go. This is what's happening in my life. And let them speak life over you. Amen? But move onward. So this is where we finish. Would you grab your communion cup? And as you do, would you just look inward? And would you just, would you just see if there's anything that is creating that dark cloud. 
anything that is creating that dark cloud, would you just spend some time right there with the Holy Spirit? And, and as you look inward, I want you to ask, why are you downcast? So line up with God's word and then look upward and say, Lord, I'm trusting you for deliverance. I'm trusting you for breakthrough. God, I want to move onward and leave this behind me. Listen, if you're here today and you're struggling, would you have the courage to raise your hand so we can, I can pray for you? I see your hands. I see your hands right here, right here. I see your hand, brother. I see hands all over the back wall. Right here, I see your hands, son. I see your hand. I see your hand, young man. I see your hands. I'm going to pray a prayer. And we're going to tear this down in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, according to your unfailing love and enduring mercy, I pray, God, for each and every heart that is represented by the hand lifted high. I pray, Lord, that you would fight for them, that you would draw ever so near, even as your word says you are a one that sticks closer than a brother. I pray, God, that through this deep, dark night of the soul, they would come to know that they can trust you. I believe that it was in this dark time in David's life that he understood what it meant. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for Jehovah Yahweh is with me that they would know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. They would feel your presence. They would feel you warring against this dark depression, scattering it never to return and release joy in their life, my King. I pray that you would, Lord, reign and rule supreme in joy, in peace, in harmony, in light, in love, that they would, Father, have a restored, renewed joy of your salvation, God. And I ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, bring breakthrough. Amen. I love you, church. I love you with all my heart. Would you take your communion? And with one voice, Lord, it was your body that was broken. We receive it. And it was your blood that was shed. We have new life in Christ. Until you return, may we be found faithful. Amen. I love you, church. Have a great week.